Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. I'm your host, Radu Palamariu, Managing Director for Asia and Europe at Elgood Global. And it is my pleasure to welcome a great guest today, Ivanka Jensen, the Chief Supply Chain Officer of Philips. Ivanka is, is one of the most prominent supply chain executives in, in our network. She has had a long, long career across different facets of supply chain in several companies across the fast moving consumer goods industries. And now for the last three years or so, she has been leading the supply chain side for Philips. Ivanka, thanks for joining us. And it's a pleasure to have you. It's my pleasure to be here, uh, Radu. So thank you for having me. And when you say a long, long, long career in supply chain, that makes me feel very old, but I forgive you for that. <laughs> yes, I, maybe I, I should work a little bit on, on that. <laughs> but maybe let's let's start with the beginning of that that journey, right? Because because I remember reading somewhere uh, something along the lines of you falling into supply chain that it wasn't necessarily what you had planned. I mean, I don't know if that many people plan for supply chain, but tell us a little bit how you ended up in supply chain in the first place. Yeah. So if you look at my study background, you know, there's nothing pointing in the direction that I would ever go and lead the supply chain for a very big company. And actually, it was it was actually my father who said at a certain point of time, he said to me, you know, if I get the future is going to be in logistics, the future is going to be in supply chain. Not that I took his advice to heart, because, you know, when you're 17, 18, 18 years old, you don't think that your father has the right things for you, pointing you in the right direction. But <laughs> what happened is that in the end, I actually, after I had finished all my studies, I took a management trainee in the port of Rotterdam. And that is the, that was the first time that I really, you know, came into a logistics company, a logistics role. I did do a two years training, a, a trainee program with them where I really had to work, you know, five shifts. So I really started from the bottom up. I literally worked in five shifts where I uh, worked on the K in the port of Rotterdam, where, you know, I was discharging and loading containers on a vessel. Then my next job, I got promoted. And that was that I had to, you know, plan the ships and, and, and make sure that, you know, the containers were all put in the, in the right position and also in such a way that you would balance the vessels. I did do a number of those type of planning roles in, in the port of, uh, of Rotterdam. So each time, you know, from planning a ship, then the next level of seniority in the roles would be that you would plan the ships coming in. So you would do all the, let's say, incoming and outcoming vessel planning. And then from there, I went into terminal management. So after the two years of trainee and working, you know, two years in five shifts, what I thought was extremely hard to do, I moved on to my next Role and I started working for Altria, being responsible for uh, customer service across their company. That's also the time when I decided that I wanted to have actually after one or two years with them that I wanted to take a break. So I took a sabbatical. I took uh, then I took my MBA in the US in Rochester, New York. And from there, actually, when I was almost finished, Altria called me back because they were moving the headquarters to Switzerland. And that is how I moved with them to Switzerland. And then I had had different roles in global logistics, in global supply chain, in global procurement. And then from there on, I moved on and I took on the managing director role for global supply chain for Diageo. So <clears throat> that is how I ended up in supply chain. So, you know, coincidentally, I would, I would say maybe still partially influenced by the fact that, you know, my dad said to me that the future is implied in supply chain. And, you know, ironically enough, he was right. So many, many years ago, I think if we look now on where we are, I think yeah. supply chain is, you know, is the area where a company can create a competitive edge. So that prompts me to ask, so what was your father doing? Like how, you know, what led him to, to, to say that? Was he in logistics and supply chain himself or what was his job? No, absolutely not. You know, he's an entrepreneur and, uh, and had nothing to do with uh, logistics and supply chain. But uh, I think he just had a forward looking view. Oh, wow. There you go. So, yeah, if you can introduce me, uh, <laughs> I'd love such <laughs> such great advice. So he definitely seems to have a knack <laughs> if he saw it that, you know, if he saw that so, so, uh, so long ago. Um, yeah. That's awesome. So secret to success. Number one, everybody listening, maybe, maybe listen to your parents. 
every so often they get it right. And yeah, I think most most of the time they get it right. It's just that depending on our age, we don't want to listen sometimes. <laughs> so this is a this is a good story for that, Ivanka. Thank you. Now moving it to a little bit to Philips and to specifically what has happened in the last well, 12, 18 months, I guess. It's been an ongoing and it still is an ongoing headache <laughs> literally in, in supply chain and then a lot of things being disrupted. But sp- speaking pragmatically, maybe you can share with us one or two case studies of what you have changed, how you're thinking differently, you're doing things differently in Philips in your supply chains to best to have adapted to this new new reality. Yeah. So there, there are a few things that you know helped us and is still helping us because I don't think we are out of the COVID impact in the supply chain and specifically also in the logistics area. So one of the things that we have done is is we went full-fledged into using AI and ML in our planning and forecasting processes. With all the volatility in, in demand, we noticed that it became almost mission impossible to produce a proper forecast. So we have created a in-house uh, solution where we have set up our own data scientist team in, uh, in, in Chennai in, the, in this case, where we also have built our own algorithms to really help us to predict the volatile demand that we see and use that uh, throughout the end-to-end uh, planning processes. At the same time, because I think we have all learned you know, that, that during COVID planning, planning ahead is so important. Planning 18 months out and make sure that you capture the true customer demand, that is going to make or break the uh, the product availability. So next to having uh, heavily invested in AI and, and ML, the next step what we have done is really boosted our SNP excellence. And we are still in the midst of that where, you know, we company-wide are, are educating every everybody on why we need to have SNOP. What is everybody's role in SNOP? Why is it so important to have an 18, 24 months rolling forecast? And we do that really top down. So we are we have masterclasses in place where the top hundred leaders of the company are being uh, being educated in SNOP. And then we cascade that further down in, into the company. We foresee to train roughly you know, more than 10,000 employees across the company in resetting why SNOP is so important. So that's the second one. So AI, investment in AI, focus on the long-term planning so we can secure capacity in our own facilities, but also with our suppliers. And then thirdly is also everything related to making sure that we have we have the logistics capacity to ship all the products in time. But we what we learned a little bit the hard way, and I, I think like many other companies, is that uh, we got hit quite badly by the shortage of containers and not having adjusted our contracts with our carriers, whether they were air freight carriers or ocean freight carriers. So we rapidly reduced the number of carriers we were, we were using. That sounds a little bit counterproductive. But what we did with the reduced carrier base is we basically made long-term commitments. And mm. we had to pay premium prices, of course, but we also got a guaranteed capacity. So we could keep our logistics flowing. So that's, that's the third one. Really secure your capacity, your logistics capacity in advance, well, uh, well in advance. Talking about logistics, you know, the other thing is uh, where there is a huge shortage is blue collar labor work. So having your facilities, whether that are your manufacturing sites, whether that are your DCs on a good level of automation, that is also where we're heavily investing, put much more automation in our DCs and manufacturing sites to reduce the dependency on blue collar labor. Mm. And then last but not least, invest in talent. Invest in your people. You know, the supply chain teams are getting tired because it is so volatile and there is so much that the supply chain teams need to do. So hold on to your to your people, invest in them, you know, find a way that people can breathe, but also invest in the in, in the future. So we are, you know, we're we are doing a lot on upskilling and reskilling of our workforce. And and when I talk about upskilling, reskilling is heavily invested in the digital capabilities. And not Mm. only a selected group in in the company, but across. We have invested in introduction courses of Python 
And it is not because we want everybody to become coders, but we want people to understand what it means. So what does it mean to go digital? What does it mean when we talk about coding? What does it mean moving away from Excel into, uh, into Python or R or whatever other programs are, are there? So we launched those uh, courses, six weeks courses, and I would have been extremely happy if we had maybe 20, 30 people joining, but we had hundreds, hundreds of people joining. And then we did do a second one. And then the, the number of attendees across uh, entire Philips, they doubled. And now we're doing mm. the third one and we see again an increase in participants. So that also indicates that people, that there is a real demand of employees to learn more about those skills. And that is what we continue to do, it, continue to invest in the digital capabilities. And we, we are having a curriculum from, let's say, my leadership team to all the way down further down in the organization. What are the, uh, are the skills and the capabilities we would like people to start acquiring? Hmm. It's a bit of a long answer, but these are the, are the five things that, that we are heavily focused on. And we continue to, to mature them. No, but fascinating, fascinating, and and uh, and allow me maybe to, to double double click a little bit on one or two of them. So maybe on the on the point on the first point that you mentioned, right, with artificial intelligence and machine learning, I, I think uh, maybe it's a preconception, or uh, at least uh, that's how I look at it. Is for a lot of people uh, why they say that machine learning doesn't work <laughs> is that it involves analyzing and creating models around the past. And then when you're hitting uh, situations that you've never had before, like COVID or uh, this, this magnitude of events that have not happened before, it's very difficult to then correctly or trust the models that come out. So I wanted, uh, I wanted you to share a little bit more on that because I've heard this several times over and I know it's not necessarily true. And maybe tell us a little bit on how and if there's any tricks and uh, tips and tricks, right, in terms of how do you set, set up these models and these teams to make sure that the models and the information you receive is, is accurate and as, at the same time useful in the, in the company. Yeah. The first one, the first tips and tricks for me is make sure you recruit the right people. So mm. make sure you, you really recruit, you know, the people with the right profiles. And if I look at, at the team that we have built, it is a highly, highly, highly capable team. So, and that, and that will take time. It will take time to build that up. So allow for that time. So don't, don't expect miracles by, you know, having a bunch of data scientists coming in and in three weeks time, they, you know, they solve your forecasting problem. So continue to invest, but also con allow for the time that, you know, you will need to do trial and error. And uh, some things are going to work, others are not going to work. Learn from it and the famous fail fast uh, methodology. Learn from it, move on and try, try again. So I think that is the first one. The second one is, and, you know, not everything we have done was, was perfect from the start. And we also learned. So, and that was one of our learnings is don't expect that you then have an AI driven forecast that you give to the markets that they know what to do with it. So, and that was what we did in the beginning. We gave, we, we basically handed it over and we were like, okay, now, you know, things are going to fall into place. Now people looked at it, they have no clue what to do with it. They say, thank you very much. We do our own thing. So make sure that there is also a coaching and mentoring program in place that if you start using the different and new technologies, that the people on the receiving end, they know what to do with it and invest time in it. And, and that is, I think, the second pillar of the tips and, tips and tricks. Mm -hmm invest time in educating, coaching, mentoring people that are being asked to work in a different way, how they, are, how they have to make that change. And that is not only in the supply chain, especially when you talk about forecasting, it also touch on your commercial teams. So it's quite a, a wide range of people that you have to bring along on the journey. So, mm -hmm. and, then, and then the third one is, you know, and that's, that's what we have done. We have built a hybrid with an external company and our own internal solutions you know, always continue to innovate and continue to look to the outside. What are the new things? Be open for feedback and say, okay, you know, from this external company we're using, they're very open to us and they guide us as well. Okay, you know, we, we think you should do X, Y, Z. So build that, build, you know, find a trusted partner that can help you to evolve. And, you know, we have deliberate cho chosen for a hybrid uh, construct, so not everything outsourced, but also not everything insourced, to really capture the, uh, you know, the feedback, the innovative uh, innovation of this company that we can then bring into, into Philips. 
Hmm. And then fourthly is, you know, AI alone is not enough because the models, you know, they, they, they will need to reset themselves because COVID has been so disruptive. Also for our industry, we had, you know, certain business units where the demand completely dropped and other business units where it spiked so big that, you know, you have to start normalizing this. But also, you know, if you if you hand over your AI forecast to, to the market, listen to the markets with their specific input and their specific knowledge and allow for the enrichment on top of the models. And if we and we measure that very strictly, if we see that consistently that the model is by the manual intervention or the enrichment is actually not being enriched, then we say we go into no touch mode. That means that, you know, for the coming whatever months, we will not touch the AI forecast anymore because then we also want to reset it again. And measuring, cons consistently measuring whether the model is doing better versus the enrichment process that we have put on top of it, I think is a critical piece of success to this. And ultimately, mm. you know, we want to go into ad autonomous planning. So ultimately, we do not want those manual interventions anymore. Yes. No, it make, makes sense and some, some really practical inputs. And I wanted also to go a little bit deeper on the part building on your, your point where, you know, making sure that you get the whole organization on the same journey, right? The commercial, the sales, that they understand why this is important and also what to do with the, with the information, right? And the forecast. And then linking it to your part with the SNOP, all right? And where you were, you mentioned that a key initiative has been to, to train people and to get them using SNOP processes to, to better and more accurately predict demand, supply, and so on. How, uh, I guess then the question is how, and are there again, some tips and tricks on that point, coming from the perspective that uh, I've heard this over and over again, where uh, there's almost uh, always in all organizations or some sort of bigger or smaller tension between sales and supply chain, <laughs> between sales and operations, where the salespeople have their own targets and they don't want to fill up the forecast or the information or, you know, so they need to be educated definitely about this importance. So tips and tricks on how did you get them on board this SNOP part? Yeah, we do a lot of tip, uh, tips and tricks here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so, so it, repeat the question to me so I, I make sure I answer it in the right way. Yeah, so if, if you have some, it, it is a common challenge for quite a few supply chain organizations that I've been exposed to, to get the buy-in from the sales, from the commercial and from the other departments at large, even finance sometimes, to, to contribute in a meaningful way to the SNOP process, to, to the information sharing and to, to make sure that this is successful, it only works as a collaboration. So you driving this process within Philips, are there certain things that you've seen work better in terms of making sure that all the different departments, all the different executives driving the different teams are on board? Yeah. So, so to answer that, what we have done, and don't get me wrong, for Philips, this has been you know, a bit of a headache for many, many, many years, but we are now on a path where we're really breaking through with the SNP process. And what we have done differently versus previous attempts to really embed SNOP, you know, as the backbone of your planning, your integrated planning uh, process, is that we have formed a group of 12, 13, really the top leaders of the company across sales, across the category management, across finance, across supply chain, across different other functions. And we also have two extra members joining us in this. So they are the sponsors. And then we are 13 ambassadors of SNOP. And what we have said, we have basically a five pillar program. And I'm looking at it here right in front of me because I have that beautiful slide in front of me where we say the first step is we learn. And we, we don't say we learn for everything we say, I learn. So I learn SNOP. That means that, that all our top hundred leaders in the companies in the company have to learn SNOP. That's why we have the master classes. So I learn. Then the second one is I adopt. We have one process, we have one cadence. And everybody in the organization that has a role to play in the individual meetings of the SNOP process, they own their respective part of the SNOP process. And they say, I adopt, I learn, I adopt. Then the third one is I play. I play my SNOP role. 
So that means you don't delegate the SNOP in, further down into the organization. No, you as the leader, you head up your respective meeting. So for example, if we talk about consensus meeting, the market leader is the owner of the consensus meeting and the market leader will be present in the consensus meeting and will also lead the consensus meeting. So I play my SNOP role. Then the third, uh, the fourth one is I ensure. I ensure I make a 18 months quality plan. And again, we, we are not delegating that low into the organization. We want to have the leaders involved. We want the leaders to look at the 18 months rolling plan. We want the leaders to put their, you know, their name behind it and say, yes, I think this is the best plan we can make. So I ensure an 18 months quality plan. And then the fifth one is I adopt. I adopt to using AI and ML. I adopt to use the AI and ML driven forecast and I enrich it to improve the accuracy. So that is, mm -hmm. these are the five steps or pillars or whatever name you want to give to it. That makes it very easy for people to rally behind it. So you learn, I learn the SNP, I adopt to one process, one cadence, I play my SNP role, I ensure 18 months quality plan, I adopt to the AI ML driven forecast and I enrich it to improve the quality of the forecast. Mm. And this, this resonates really well across the business, across the organization. And we see, you know, we also see the energy and the enthusiasm behind this. It's not anymore, you know, a supply chain thing you have to do. It's not anymore, I do this for supply chain. No, I do this, you know, for myself. I do this for my customers. I do this because, you know, with a better planning ahead, I will make sure I can fulfill my, uh, my orders and fulfill the wishes and, and my promises to my customer in time and on full. Yes. No, and, and, and I really like the, the emphasis on accountability. Yeah? And, you know, it's, it's each and every individual is an executive driving and manager driving. It's not, not up for delegation, <laughs> which, which never, never works that well. So, so, yeah, very, very interesting principles, good, uh, good pillars of accountability. Finally, from, from my side, Ivanka, I wanted to, to ask you more on the part with talent, right? So, of course, it is all about the people. It's, uh, it's, it's something that we, we all know, and COVID has only, again, put a lot of focus on that. At the same time, you said that make sure that people get breaks. At the same time, I think everybody's tired. It's been a nonstop fight against uh, logistics disruptions, lack of capacity, whatever it might be. Or whatever lockdowns and so on are there certain things that you put into place into your teams to to make sure that you know whether it was mental well-being whether it was i don't know taking and doing some offline teamwork or how did you ensure that people were indeed taking rest and they were well looked after around this this time given that yeah. remotely it's much much more, more difficult to do than if you're in the office yeah no it, it, indeed and, and i think it is a big concern the mental well-being of uh, specifically the supply chain teams is under a tremendous pressure. You know, we already had a 24-7 economy, I would say, but this has now tripled maybe even a five-fold by all the, 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 the challenges that we see, whether it is e-component shortages, whether it is raising shortages, whether it is logistics constraints, you name it. So what we, what we do is we, first of all, we, we really have, you know, we are actively addressing this. We also really ask people in our employee, employee engagement surveys to give us, you know, their comments on where we have to improve, what is happening, what, you know, what they want to see more of, and then have those open conversations on how we can make sure and ensure that people, you know, that we offload the pressure of them. Mm. Um, for me personally, with my leadership team, what we do is we, we have what we call booster calls in place. Those calls are, you know, we don't talk about all the issues we have. We don't talk, talk about the, you know, the business. We talk about ourselves. So how we feel, how do we, you know, how we re-energize ourselves. We also, you know, talk about what we see with, with our teams, what, you know, what we need to do to keep them energized and where we see, you know, where in certain cases, the pressure goes too high, how we can help those teams and individuals to reset their work-life balance. And this is not something that, you know, goes away from, from one day to another. This will, this will continue. This will be here for Q4 
and the only thing that we can do is you know prepare ourselves as leaders and and in in my case uh, you know i have to stay positive the moment i am not positive anymore and i am going to pass on the stress to the teams it will deteriorate and mm. what we also do is you know within the leadership team we give us we give each other really open feedback and I had, you know, one of my leaders giving me the feedback and, and he was he was right. He said, Ivanka, you have to stay positive. You always have a positive energy. So keep your positive energy. And, you know, we need to continue to do that with each other. Give the open feedback, act on it and, you know, and manage through. Altogether, mm. Q4 for, you know, not only Philips, but for, for most companies, Q4 is going to be a pressure cooker in the supply chain, in the logistics area. We all will have our peak periods there. There will be an enormous rush on you know, capacity in all kinds of forms. And we need to help the teams to manage through and also accept that things go wrong. You know, we will miss shipments. We will have mistakes. We will have things not going flawlessly. Then don't you know, pass on, the, on the, the stress and the pressure into the teams. So what I also do is very much work with the commercial teams to, to create that understanding because, you know, in many cases, if something goes wrong in the supply chain area, it will have an impact on the customer. So do a lot of upfront communication to the market so they also can inform their customers what is happening. And these are the things that we that we put in place. Stay very close to your own team. Listen to them and, you know, maybe do things that you haven't done before, but give them a boost, give them an energy boost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very well said. And on the topic of diversity, I also linking you to talent because you're a great advocate of, of, of diversity and diverse teams. More, We need more women in supply chain. We need more ethnic groups in supply chain and not only in supply chain, I mean, at large in companies, right? So maybe tell us, and I know there's a couple of initiatives that you're also pioneering within uh, Philips and, and in your previous companies as well. So maybe tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so, you know, I I really thrive by having an inclusive and diverse team. I think it enriches the team, creates much more of of a balance on how, you know, how we work, how we operate, but it is also, you know, just a reflection of society. So I always think that, you know, the more you can reflect society in the work environment, the closer you will also get to, you know, where our consumers and customers are. So for me, that is, you know, it's almost a no-brainer. I sometimes find it actually quite disappointing that we still need to talk about it, that we still need to put additional efforts in creating those inclusive and diverse teams. I'm really proud on that if I see in the employee engagement surveys that in my team, in the extended team, that inclusion and diversity is scoring extremely high. And that means that people, you know, they feel that they, that they can be themselves. And mm. when you can be yourself at work, you know, you're going to give the best of yourself. You're going to be happy. And because you're happy, you deliver, you know, a better outcome. And for me, it's it's such a no-brainer. But I do see that, you know, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to attract diverse team members into the team. If you look, if we focus on gender equality, it is still very difficult to find the females to come and work in supply chain. And, you know, the more we go also in, into the techno, in using technology, the struggle even gets bigger. So we will need to continue to invest, you know, early on when people choose what they're going to study, uh, work very closely with, you know, with the universities to make sure that we continue to promote having females, girls going and choose those paths that they already start when they start choosing what they're going to study. So, you know, you start creating a pipeline from university onwards, maybe even earlier, to create those, get yeah, the, the pipeline of, of females coming into supply chain or other STEM related roles. And that is a, an effort that we can't slow down. We need to, you know, it's not that at a certain point of time, it will all be there. I, I believe for, you know, the coming whatever years, this will need to be a, a very deliberate choice and investment of companies like ourselves to to really help create this pipeline of, of females coming in. And also, you know, when you when you have positions open, I really advocate always, let's have at least one male, one female candidate in the end in the end round so we have an equal choice 
And that is not easy. And eh? that is sometimes you have to make choices because otherwise you slow down the process too much. But it does help. It does help. I have 60% of my leadership team is female. And we came from a very low base. I think we had 17% somewhere three years ago. So it does help if you have to focus on it. Mm. No, absolutely. And I, I heard a term the other day, I was talking about diversity and inclusion on the panel. And uh, to, your, to your point, yes, we, maybe it's high time that we stop talking and then it just becomes a normal on the, on the reality side. It, it, we still have a long, a long way to go. And the term was, yes, where's the ROI? But the ROI meaning return on inclusion which I love I love the, the phrase right because we talk about return on investment but it's really a return on inclusion and that comes in the form of having companies that are more inclusive having cultures and teams that work and function better because ultimately all companies sell a product or a service to the society to your point and the society is very diverse so it can only help and and I think only the companies that will do that will ultimately strive and the other ones will will eventually be left behind so uh, yes, hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later we get we get there, Ivanka. Final final question from me uh, as a there you go tips and tricks again. Yeah? See, I, I think I, I have a I have something with this. But if you were to give an advice right to to your younger self or to somebody that's just graduating and looking to to build a successful career over the years, what what would be some advice that helped you the most in your career? So actually, because I, I was going through the different questions up front and, uh, and someone said to me on this question, say, don't choose supply chain. So now that's <laughs> a joke. But uh, <laughs> so I truly, you know, I, I love what I do. And I am, I'm actually very happy I'm in, in supply chain because you're really in between, you know, you're in between the operations and you're in between the commercial teams and, and you have a total overview of what basically is happening in, in the chain. And you can make a real difference in supply chain. So, you know, one of, the, one of the tips and tricks I would give is, you know, I also now believe that supply chain and logistics is the future. You know, that is where a, a competitive edge is going to be created. If you are able to really, you know, orchestrate the supply chain in such a way that you're extremely agile, fast, and always have the customer at heart in everything you do. If you can get there as an organization, you're going to be miles ahead of competition. And, you know, if you have a passion to do so, you know, go into supply chain, go into supply chain. It is, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful area to build your career in. But, you know, supply chains are always under pressure. So my advice to people is, is working in the supply chain or, you know, maybe choosing to have a career in supply chain is build the resilience, build your own resilience. And, you know, you, you need to be able to not take everything always too personal and, and uh, at heart. Because that is the nature of being in supply chain is that there will always be something that needs to be improved. There will always be something that maybe goes wrong. But, you know, as long as you always have the one thing in mind that you want to achieve, and that is this customer first mentality, everything we do, everything you do is linked to delighting our customers and our consumers and, you know, working in Philips that, that is, you know, very easy to relate to with the purpose that we have, you know, then, then you just, you, you feel, you, every day you feel good because every day, you know, we deliver our beautiful products to our cost, customers, to our consumers. And that is, you know, that gives such a gratifying feeling. So I definitely would recommend a career in supply chain. I think a lot of people can thrive in it. It is going to be one of the areas where companies are really going to create a competitive edge and you can feel extremely gratified day in, day out. And also, you know, at the end of your career. Mm, super. Ivanka, on that note, I want to thank you for, uh, for the great sharing. Many good examples uh, today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for walking us through some of the great work that you've uh, you've been doing at Philips. And yeah, good luck with the um, you know with Q4. Make sure that you also take some rest <laughs> because I'm sure there's not going to be a lot of a lot of, of space for that. But fingers crossed that, that that you navigate well, and then 2022 will be better for all of us. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to go to www.elcodglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. 
Also subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest updates first. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify or Stitcher, we would appreciate a kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what, what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help.